We're good. Can people hear me? All right, good. All right, okay. Sorry. All right, okay. So, uh, all right, okay, good. Uh, so, I guess probably many of you have taken a LACE course. So, uh, I'm not going to motivate too much about why we care about reinforcement learning. So, it's making new stories uh, every once in a while. Um, so, in comparison to many of the more classical settings, like supervised learning, uh, control theory, uh, there are some new things here. There are a lot of similarity, but there are also some new things here. For example, like many or majority of the control work, uh, they sort of assume that model is known. Uh, reinforcement learning, the majority of the cases, we have to take up samples in order to learn the unknown environment. So this is one big difference in many of the IO works compared to uh, control works. Uh, the other thing compared to supervised learning, IO usually once you take an action, you only get some uh, instantaneous feedback or immediate feedbacks there. Uh, you do not, you're not going to see how this affects a long-term effect. So you have to take into account your past experience in order to gradually learn and approach your ultimate goal. So this is another very different um, uh, properties there. There are some similarities there. Uh, for example, I, uh, in RL, in most of the machine learning settings so far, uh, we're encountering uh, unprecedented uh, dimensionality of the problem. So the explosion of the dimensionality actually really becomes a critical factor that affects many things like data efficiencies, the computational efficiencies, so on and so forth, which has to be taken into account. Um, finally, there's a non conversity issue that's almost everywhere. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about the non conversity part today, but this actually also motivates a lot of recent research into policy optimizations. All right, so my focus is going to be more on the uh, data efficiency part. So because of part of because of the uh, motivation that I just mentioned, we have we have to take samples in order to understand the environment. And because of we have enormous dimensionality, we have to this result of requires us to take many, many more samples um, than previous in previous uh, applications. But data collection still could be very, very uh, difficult, challenging part because it might be inexpensive, it might be uh, time consuming, sometimes it's not that safe. So all of these have to sort of like limit our uh, capability of transferring our success in uh, IO theory to practice. So in order to make it more applicable in practice, we have to really rethink about what is the best algorithm in terms of sample efficiency and uh, can we reduce it, reduce it, reduce it in order to, you know, eventually make it more practical uh, in practice. So I, my, my talk is going to center around the data efficiency issue. All right, okay, so this is uh, uh, sort of like a picture uh, about, uh, so RL is not a new field. It has been developed by many, many, many years, actually. Um, uh, usually it has been a topic before probably everyone was born here. All right, okay, so, uh, but, uh, why there are still new things for us to uh, uh, investigate here. Many of the older analysis or class, more classical analysis, I would argue that a majority of them actually focuses a lot more on the what I call asymptotic analysis. When I say asymptotic, it sort of means that you look at an algorithm like you're learning, um, you let the iteration go to infinity uh, with all other parameters held fixed. Uh, that sort of tell you some uh, something about whether it converges, whether ultimately, and where how fast it converges. Uh, but if you would really want to take into account what's happening in modern applications, where the dimension of the problem is an important factor, it's very very large, uh, and then in these cases, the number of iterations you are going to run is probably you know not actually usually much smaller than the dimension of the problem. And in these cases, uh, you probably have to uh, 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 take a step back to try to consider probably a more finite sample, finite horizon, uh, you know, finite time kind of analysis in order to better account for the impact of a lot of the salient problem, problem parameters there, like the size of the state, size of the action space, um, uh, horizon lengths, so on and so forth. Uh, fortunately, there are a lot of uh, uh, new theory, theoretical toolbox that have been developed in the past few years. 
uh, in particular in the high dimensional probability, high dimensional statistics, uh, all of them, even though they are tackling different fields, the tools developed there actually can be readily uh, used to help us understand RL in large dimension and to get a finite sample, finite time uh, kind of uh, uh, analysis bounds there. Uh, so in my talk, we're just going, I'm just going to try to focus on this non-asymptotic aspect of it and then try to give you some examples about um, uh, what kind of uh, non-asymptotic bounds you are going to expect it to have. All right, okay. All right, okay. So, uh, so sample complexity is going to be the uh, main focus today. Uh, so I was working on information theory during the first several years of my uh, my um, PhD. Uh, so if you are an information theorist, uh, natural questions for you are, first of all, uh, what is the fundamental limits there? And then second of all, whether there's any algorithm that can help you achieve it. And ideally, this can be an efficient algorithm. All right, okay. So, um, and when I enter the, the reinforcement learning field, this become a natural question there for me. So I try to keep this way of thinking to examine the, some of the existing algorithms uh, in the field. Then when you open almost every uh, topic, uh, you can see papers saying that minimize optimal uh, design um, uh, for almost every setting step. Uh, but then uh, when we try to take a closer look on each of these paper, and typically we realize that the, the the optimality that they mentioned typically takes the following form, which is essentially saying, so here I'm plotting the sample size as a fun, uh, fun, uh, regret as a fun, function of the sample size. Uh, and this is typically what uh, people claim about their optimality. So if the sample size exceeds um, some threshold, usually a very, very large threshold, uh, the algorithm, they come up with an algorithm that's able to um, you know, achieve uh, some minimize optimality that matches the information theoretic low about. But if you are below this, unfortunately, there is a gap between uh, what is achievable and also the lower bound. All right. So this is like a, a big gap between achievability and converse. You know, uh, essentially, I'm trying to use some wording from the um, the information theory, and that's essentially about how to close whether there is hope to close the, the gap between these two things. All right, and this is also reminiscent of what has happened in the statistics literature. In the old classical statistics, people typically focus on the large sample theory, where the number of samples approach infinity. Uh, and then you can say, you know, asymptotically, what is your optimal variance, things like that. Uh, the more recent trend is sort of move to move on to the uh, high dimensional uh, regime where everything can be large. In those regimes, we really have to rethink about what is going on there because you don't have enough samples, but you care about this regime. So you really need to think about how to find optimal algorithms for this kind of regimes. All right, so another uh, way to, form, form, uh, to, to, uh, to, to describe this is that usually many of the algorithms that are claimed to be optimal uh, impose a very, very large burning cost there. So, but this burning cost is not something that is so large that we do not really like to see them in practice. All right, okay, so these are some nicer settings and, and I'm going to describe two of them today. And they are also even harder settings where, you know, like uh, even when you, are, you allow your sample size to go to infinity, maybe there is there's still a big gap there and this becomes a much harder setting. So I'm not going to talk about things here, but it's a, it provides very rich opportunities for people to explore. All right, okay. All right, okay. So uh, this is my plan today. Uh, I'm going to try to bring together some of the ideas from you know, things like high dimensional statistics uh, and to try to see whether there's any hope for us to close the gap between achievability and lower bounds in some of the settings here. Uh, I'm going to focus only on the first two things, which is in the interest of time. Uh, first one, it's a very idealistic case called the RL with the generative model. I'm going to tell you what this is. Second one, it's a very challenging thing called uh, on, uh, that has something to do with online exploration. Uh, one interesting message here is, uh, so, and, and by the way, we are focusing more on the 
the notion of minimize optimality here. Uh, but in all of these settings, uh, essentially the only algorithm that we have known so far that is able to achieve what I call full range optimality uh, is a model-based algorithm. Um, uh, even though model-free algorithm is very popular in practice and you can achieve you know, uh, optimality when sample size is large enough, none of them is able to provably achieve information variety limits in the sample hungry regime. All right, so this is uh, uh, one of the key message here. Uh, and what is a model-based algorithm? Model-based algorithm is the kind of plug-in approach uh, that I'm going to describe uh, in a few minutes. And feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. All right. All right, okay. Uh, so the first thing that I'm going to do is to quickly go through what the, some of the background. I know not everyone has worked on reinforcement learning and people, you guys might, many of you might be using different notations as, uh, as I do. So I'm going to introduce some basic notation. I try to keep it to the minimum so that you don't, uh, uh, you don't feel overwhelmed by this. All right. All right. Okay. So, uh, reinforcement learning. Most of the time, we model it. If the single agent case, we model it through a um, mark of decision process (MDP). Uh, I'm going to use S to represent the number of states. Uh, I'm going to use A to represent the number of actions. So, so that it's very easy to remember. Both of them are supposed to be very, very large. All right. In modern applications. So I have a mark of decision process. I have an agent every time based on his or her perceived state of the environment uh, is going to make and take an action. The action is called AT. After the action is taken, the environment is going to generate an immediate reward. Uh, and this is uh, something that lies between zero and one for simplicity. Uh, and then the environment is going to transition to the next state. All right. And you keep taking actions, and this is what the mark of decision process looks like. Um, the way you are going to choose uh, action is going to be called a policy. All right, so I'm going to use pi to to represent it. It can be either deterministic or randomized action selection rule. Uh, finally, the it's a the final element is uh, called transition kernel. All right, so it's a Markov process. So uh, this transition kernel that sort of specify how uh, the dynamics transitions from state to the other state, depending on how uh, the actions are taken. All right, so P isn't, but this is unknown and it's a very dumb, large dimensional object. So we need to pay particular attention to this. All right, okay. So the other thing that we need to properly define is a utility function. Uh, in RL, the utility function is typically the value function. Uh, and value function, uh, there are two different scenarios that are widely uh, investigated. The first one is the so-called uh, infinite horizon discounted stationary case. This is the case where you know you can run, you have an episode that can run until infinity, uh, but because of uh, in order to you, you want to look at the cumulative reward, but if you want to make it mathematical meaningful, you try to inc include some discount factor there, gamma to the T in order to sort of like make sure that you only look, you don't look at infinite number of uh, rewards, you only look at, you know, rewards within some certain range. So this gamma sort of determines something called effective horizon, which is one over one minus gamma. Uh, and that essentially is like, this is sort of like the order of the number of steps that matter. Okay. There's another popular setting, which is a finite horizon non-stationary case uh, where you, you have a fixed number of horizon, even though this H is, could be very, very large as well. So in many situations, uh, these are very, these, these look like very different scenarios. Uh, but many of the times, the results are very, very similar to each other. Oftentimes, you just replace H by one over one minus gamma. Uh, you can translate result from this finite horizon setting to the infinite horizon setting. So uh, things are um, uh, many times exchangeable in these cases. All right, okay. And our goal is to try to find the best policy that optimizes this utility function, which is the value function. Yeah. All right, okay, so the optimal, uh, we're going to find the, so what we call the optimal policy that maximizes the, re, uh, the value function. 
uh, the optimal value is going to be denoted by either V star or V pi star. So whenever I have a star there, it sort of means some sort of optimality. All right, okay, so this is the uh, basic uh, notation and setting needed here. All right, okay. All right, okay, so if the model is known, so basically means that if P, the transition kernel, and the reward function are known to you, uh, then the problem is not difficult. So you can go to uh, like Dimitri Basica's book, which sort of like tell you how to use dynamic programming to solve it. And this can be solved in the tractable way. So it's not a hard problem for either finite horizon case or infinite horizon case. Things can be done within polynomial time, actually in a fast manner. So this problem is considered solved uh, in, in those settings. Okay. Now the challenge is that uh, if you do not have the uh, model specification, uh, well, how are you going to do? Because you you do not know, know the, the environment, so you have to take samples in order to understand it. In the meantime, you have to make try to make the best decision. And how do the model estimation and decision making, you know, uh, uh, inference impact each other and how to find the best way to achieve uh, the best decision making outcome there. All right, okay, so this is what we are going to investigate uh, in the talk today. Okay. All right, okay, so now uh, there are two popular classes of uh, uh, algorithms here. Actually, at least two. There are actually more than two things here. The first one is called the model-based approach. The model-based approach is the following. Okay, so I have some samples. I have got a lot of samples. And then you with these samples, I probably can try to use them to build an empirical model of the true transition kernel, okay? After that, I'm going to pretend that this p hat is the true model. And then if this is the true model, I can use the dynamic programming approach uh, to help, help us find the optimal policy. All right, so model base essentially means that I first try to estimate the model and then use the model to help me find the optimal policy. Uh, there's another approach, uh, which is called model-free algorithm, which is something that I learned from Lei here, actually. So um, essentially, this is an approach where you do not try to explicitly compute the model. Uh, you just focus on, because your final object is not to estimate the model, but rather to find the optimal policy, find the optimal value function, so on and so forth. So let's try to just find a way to learn without uh, estimating the model explicitly. And and uh, popular algorithms like uh, TD learning, Q learning are all like model free approach. So my talk today, uh, I'm going to focus on the model based approach uh, because of the um, uh, its effectiveness in achieving the optimal sample efficiency. All right, okay. So uh, so so far I talk about what is a model based algorithm, but one thing that I have not talked about is that. What are the sampling mechanisms there, right? How do you even collect samples? And in fact, the way you collect samples are going to significantly uh, affect your uh, data efficiency there, right? So there are at least three different types of sampling uh, mechanisms. Uh, the first one, it's the most idealistic case. Uh, it's called a simulator. So it's like the fall or generative model. Uh, it's like this. So you have an oracle such that that allows you to go to any state, any action to take a samples independently. It doesn't happen in many of the practical scenario because you cannot really access arbitrary state, arbitrary actions. Uh, but this is a simulated environment, so it allows you to do that. Okay. It has some of the um, applications, for example, like in sometimes even in autonomous driving. Uh, kind of experiments, people have some similarity environment and will try to simulate what's going on in, in the real world. All right, so this is a very, very idealistic model uh, came up with by um, Michael Kearns and uh, I think back in 1999, so many, many years ago, actually. 
a much more practical uh, way to do it is so-called online reinforcement learning. So this is something that's closer to like a bandit setup that many of you might have already been familiar with. This is like the following. I'm going to choose a policy, use it to execute my MDP for one episode. All right. After I get the sample trajectory, I'm going to adjust my uh, policy. I'm going to retake the uh, uh, a sample trajectory again, and so on and so forth, until I have a collection of data. But since you are taking samples by interacting with the MDP in real time, this usually is much more, much less flexible compared to the generative model, and as a result, usually much more challenging. There's a final thing that I I'm not going to talk about today. It's uh, offline reinforcement learning. This is a case where um, you are not allowed to take real-time samples, but you have access to a large um, historical data set. And how are you going to use, leverage your historical data set uh, to transfer useful information to a new task? All right, okay. And there could be an arbitrary combination of these three things. Like some, sometimes people consider the hybrid RIO is like combining second and third uh, mechanisms. So the question that I'm interested in is that how many, for each of these uh, sampling mechanisms, uh, how many samples are needed in order for me to learn epsilon optimal policy? Meaning that I find a policy pi hat such that the resulting value function is epsilon close to at most epsilon away from the optimal value function. Go ahead. Um, during the online phase, are you still trying to maximize reward or is that just like, um, I'm going to make it more clear in the field. Basically, uh, we, we still, the goal is still try to do that, but you are going to sort of like minimize regrets there. Uh, you, you probably cannot do, achieve this uh, in the way that as competent as the simulator case, because there might be a lot of uh, states uh, that you have never been able to visit it. So we are going to focus more on the regret setting, but actually very close to this one as well. All right. All right, okay, so uh, the first uh, part is about the generative model. Uh, this is uh, the first paper that we have written uh, towards this end. So mathematically, uh, this is perhaps one of the easiest way to describe uh, um, uh, data collection mechanism. So there is an oracle. Every time you can go to this oracle, say, okay, I want to understand a state action pair essay. And then this guy is going to generate the uh, one sample transition from this one to the next state to you. And they are going to generate it in a indep completely independent map. So it's, all right, okay. And you can query this like multiple times. For example, if you say, I want to understand SA, but give me N samples, I'm going to collect N in ID samples from this ground truth tra transition curve. All right, so this is going to be uh, the sampling mechanism I have. And after I take the samples for every single state action pairs, I, in total, I get S times A times capital N, uh, total number of samples. Uh, my goal is to see whether I can construct an optimal, uh, a policy that is clo close enough to the optimal policy. All right. All right, okay, so some of the previous work. Um, so before our work, this is essentially uh, uh, the achievability region uh, uh, accommodating all the prior works. So I'm plotting here a sample complexity as a function of one over epsilon square. Epsilon is the target accuracy level. All right, okay, so if you look at this curve, you see that you have a sort of like a straight line after epsilon becomes sufficiently uh, small. Uh, but here it's sort of like flat there. The question is uh, whether this is a optimal region. Now it turns out that this is partially the optimal thing because if you, you, you compare it with the lower bound. So when epsilon is smaller than this order, and you see that the achievability region and the, the lower bounds sort of match. 
but if you go even uh, uh, closer to this end, uh, it turns out that there's still a gap there. All right, okay. So another way to interpret this is that uh, if you look at all the prior works, uh, all of the prior works can only hope to achieve optimal uh, minimize optimality when the sample size already exceed this order. But if your sample size is below this order, uh, they are not able to make any further improvement. The question is uh, whether um, which one is the, the correct scaling there. So this is a lower bound. There are two possibilities. One is that uh, the upper bound is loose. One is that the lower bound is loose. So uh, what is the right answer in this case? All right, so this is something that we'd like to uh, uh, investigate. All right, okay. So um, now I'm going to talk about the so-called model-based approach for this problem. It's extremely simple. So the sampling process is already done. Now the next step is going to be model estimation. Now for model estimation, we just do the naive thing, okay? For every state action pair S and A, I'm going to just count empirically uh, how many samples you know end up with this S prime. So it's just like an empirical estimate of a probability probability vector. So very very simple thing. Okay. All right. Okay. Now after that, after I get this uh, empirical model, I'm going to plug this in to a dynamic programming algorithm called uh, policy iteration, value iteration, whatever you want. Uh, and then that's going to and generate a policy um, uh, for you. All right. All right, okay. So unfortunately, this is actually, this is the algorithm uh, before our work. This is actually the state of the art uh, results there. This is the uh, algorithm analyzed by the Agawa et al that sort of I achieved the best, uh, the boundary of the achievable region uh, that I just plotted in the previous slide. What we propose here is that, okay, we would like to make progress towards improving this algorithm. And the way we, we do it is uh, add some very, very uh, small step here. So essentially I'm going to insert this part. Now, what is this part? So empirical model, I keep it the same as the previous one. I'm just going to manipulate the reward function a tiny little bit. And the way I do it is that in the original reward function, I add some Gaussian noise there. I'm going to add very, very tiny amount of uh, Gaussian noise there, and that's it, okay? And then with this new reward function, I'm going to still use the empirical model uh, and then run the dynamic programming approach and that's, you know, like the, that generates the policy I want. So I call it the um, perturbed version of model-based approach. All right, okay. So, uh, so this is our algorithm. Now the question is that, why do we even uh, expect a model-based approach to, to work or not? The challenge can be, uh, can be characterized in this picture. So uh, if you look at the true uh, uh, transition kernel, it is large dimensional. It's S times A times S dimensional. So it's very large thing. But if you look at the empirical estimate we have, actually it contains a lot of zeros there if the number of samples is below this dimensionality there, right? And this is oftentimes the case. You do not have samples to even cover, even make sure that you have one sample for each of the state action. Uh, state combination here. So a lot of zeros there, which essentially means that if you compute the TV distance between P and P hat, it's like close to one. It means that, you know, it's not going to be useful in terms of uh, model estimation here. Now the question is that, since we are not sure that we have a good model estimate, why do we even uh, believe that it might be, how can we even trust the policy generated based on this model estimate there? Okay. All right, okay. It turns out that the nice, very nice thing about this part is that even though model cannot be made estimated in a reliable way, the policy can be. 
Okay, so we can actually learn the optimal near optimal policy as long as the sample's complexity exceeds the uh, information theoretic limit. So this is the full result. Uh, for arbitrary epsilon, so epsilon can be epsilon can be zero to the largest possible limits there. Um, the, the, the policy generated by our algorithm uh, can find uh, epsilon uh, 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 optimal policy as long as the sample size exceeds this order. And if you remember, this is the, actually the order uh, that turns out to match the information theoretic limit there. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to get into any details about the, the proof, just to tell you two, uh, 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 two of the key ideas here. The first one is called the leave one out analysis, which is a very, very useful thing for us to try to decouple statistical dependency. They are very, very complicated statistical dependency in the sample hungry regime, and we need some uh, more powerful statistical tools in order to handle this. Uh, the other thing is uh, uh, the role of random perturbation. So the only role about the reward perturbation is that we want to break the tie. We do not want there to have many uh, equally performing optimal policies there. But once you add the tiny little bit of uh, random perturbation, you can sort of make sure that there is only a single policy that is optimal there. And this actually helps analysis a lot. All right, okay, so this finishes the first part of my um, my talk here. So the conclusion is that very basic model-based plug-in approach is full range optimal. So you sort of like completely close the gap. Well, okay, not completely, but closes the gap between achievability and converse up to some logarithmic factor. All right, okay, any question before I move on to the second? Yeah, can you explain the intuition like if the model is not correct, how could you learn the optimal? Uh, the, the idea is that, so your optimal, your value function should be viewed as a projection of your uh, probability transition kernel onto some particular direction, like the reward direction or something like that. So eventually you are only trying to learn some projection of this one onto the lower dimensional space. And the value function, it's a S, uh, the Q function or value, Q function is like S A dimensional rather than, you know, S A S dimensional. So you are essentially, you only focus on the low dimension. Part. So can, can I think uh, like if uh, I query samples from a pair of S A, if the next state S prime somehow does not appear in my sample, then this is a, like a typical next state. I, I can just ignore that. It won't affect my... Is, estimation means learning of the optimal. Uh, but but if your p is like uniform, for example, right. but if you are only able to take two samples, right. you are not ignoring significant. You are ignoring many normal states. You are not just ignoring the non-significant states. Yeah, so that's I'm sure. Yeah. And that's my question. If you just take two samples, ignore like a lot of the normal state. And how could you recover the optimal? Uh, because of this random thing, usually like even, so when, when you take, for example, this is, I think the nice thing about high dimensional probability, right? If you have a vector and multiply by another, so you take it in the product, but if one, one of them is significantly under sample, so they still concentrate roughly around the mean there. So, and, and, and you can very, very significantly under sample, but still keep everything same. So, yeah. So as long as the number of samples exceed the degrees of freedom, usually it's fine. And degrees of freedom here is roughly like this SA thing rather than SAS. Any other question? All right, okay. So the the more challenging part, it's uh, uh, this is the latest paper that I have uh, on, to, on online learning and we try to find a way to settle this problem as well. Um, just to uh, quickly describe the setting. Uh, so online IO is a case where you, you do not have access to the simulator environment anymore. Uh, the only thing that you can do is uh, you go to the real environment, interact with it, and then take samples in real time. All right. And the most difficult part, it's about how to manage the exploration and exploitation trade-off. 
you know, essentially uh, the entire literature of Bandy is uh, focusing on uh, how to uh, trade off uh, exploration and uh, exploitation. All right, okay. So if I make it slightly more precise, this is going to be the, the problem. So I'm going to switch attention to the finite horizon case where you have uh, edge steps. You are, it's an episodic case. You are going to take a bunch of episodes there. All right, okay. So in uh, every episode, you execute a policy. You get a sequence of uh, stay action reward sequence. All right. After that, after you observe this, uh, you, you can revise your uh, uh, policy, for example, Pi2, and then you continue to do this. All right, okay. You just keep doing this until, let's say, you have done collected K, capital K of the episodes there. All right, okay. The goal is to, uh, uh, I think someone asked uh, the 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 goal here. The goal becomes usually becomes minimizing the regret. All right. Uh, so this is essentially the following thing. So because every time I'm I'm choosing a policy I want. All right. Okay. Um. Then, but by choosing this, I might actually suffer from some suboptimality compared to executing the optimal policy. And every time I have some gap there. And regret is like a cumulative uh, suboptimality there. Okay. Many times this actually can be trans translated to the po pure policy learning kind of things. Because for example, once you have a good regret, you can take a uniform, you can choose a policy from these K choices uniformly at random. And oftentimes that becomes a good thing um, um, uh, with high probability. Okay. All right, but this is a more standard uh, metric uh, study in the in the in the literature. So let me just focus on this. All right, okay. So there has been a lower bound uh, that has been rigorously characterized by this work in uh, 2021. And they said in the minimax sense, uh, you won't be able to beat this level. So H is the horizon length, S is the number of states, A is the number of actions, T is the uh, total number of samples you take. You take k episodes. Uh, each k episode has h different samples. So in total, t is like k times h. Anyway, there is some low about there, and there has been a large number of algorithms that have been come up with uh, in order to try to uh, get closer and closer to this one. Uh, one of my former colleague uh, Chi Jin actually contributed a lot towards this one. All right. The question is that so after uh, all of uh, we we seen all of these uh, algorithms. Which one is the best one? All right. Okay. Now, uh, but before I do that, let me just try to briefly mention some of the key concepts that are needed in order to achieve efficient things in online settings, uh, which is about this exploration exploitation trade off. And starting from many, many years ago, I think probably 1978 or something like that, um, uh, Professor Lai and Professor Robbins uh, from the statistics community actually come up with this uh, uh, UCB type of things. It's this so-called optimism in the face of uncertainty. So it essentially means that every time you're trying to make exploration based on your optimistic estimates of each for each of the actions. And the way you make this optimistic estimate is that you start from your estimate, but you're going to add some uncertainty level, like a confidence level on top of it to make it larger. And you are going to make it so choose actions based on this optimistic estimates rather than your the, the, the true estimate you like. Okay, so this is a UCB thing that has inspired a huge number of works in bandits and reinforcement. All right, okay, so now I'm still coming back to the model-based approach. If I want to use model-based approach for uh, RL, uh, one natural way is to try to incorporate this UCB framework into the plugin approach I just mentioned. It's going to be more complicated, but it's also not super complicated to um, incorporate this thing. 
And this leads to a sort of like a famous algorithm uh, called UCB VI. VI means value iteration. So UCB idea incorporated into one of the mo famous model-based algorithm there. It has been done by Azar et al. like in 19, uh, uh, sorry, 2017. Um, the algorithm is like this. In every episode, this is what I'm going to do. Okay, so this is not yet what I'm going to do, but this is a good starting point to think about. So if I have perfect, if I do not need to explore, this is the dynamic programming method I mentioned. So I work backward. I work from the last step backward. And every time I run this sort of like Bellman operator or something like that, uh, and then keep moving backward. And this is the, the standard dynamic programming approach called uh, value iteration. Now I'm going to, on top of it, I'm going to add one thing. He said, I'm, I don't want to just use this dynamical pro dynamic pro programming approach to do exploration. Instead, I'm going to make it bigger. And the way I make it larger is that I'm going to introduce, add some so-called bonus term. The way you understand the bonus term is that this is like an uncertainty level of uh, what, you, what you have so far. Uncertainty thing, you can and try to understand this, say, you know, you can use some concentration bounds to tell you, you know, this is the, with high probability, this is uh, the level of confidence you have. And that's typically the thing. After you get this, you have a Q estimate for every step. And then you just do greedy search. All right, okay. So you look at the Q function estimate and that will sort of tell you Based on this, you can the greedy choice will tell you how to choose a policy. All right, so you do that, and then after this pi h is determined, you use it to collect a new episode, and then you repeat. All right, so this is a very very uh, famous algorithm UCB VI in the online RL literature. Now the question is how good this is. Um, Again, let's come back to this kind of curve. Now I'm plotting regret as a function of the sample size. And as I already mentioned, this is a fundamental lower bounds that has been characterized. Now, it turns out that people are able to show that if T goes to infinity, uh, UCB VI is the optimal choice you have. However, this requires your sample size to exceed this threshold. And this threshold is S to the third order, A to the fourth order, and H to the sixth order. But S, A, H are all going to be enormous in the modern application. So this is not something that you can afford uh, in practice. All right. All right. Okay. So this sort of like also a, 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 a limitation that sort of like motivates uh, us, our investigation. All right, so it has two potential issues there. One is that it has a huge burning cost there. The other thing is that uh, it has a large memory complexity there because it is a model-based approach. So in this talk, we're going to illustrate how to uh, uh, take care of this using model-based approach. Unfortunately, model-based approach is not able to take care of the memory complexity there. So you usually have to come back to the model-free approach, but uh, you know, then depending on so what is the most important uh, factor for you there. And let me just also quickly mention uh, all others. So this is the first algorithm that achieved asymptotic regret optimality. And after that, there have been a large number of works that try to make improvements from different angles. And these are the algorithms that eventually are able to achieve regret optimality there. But if you look at each of them, the red part sort of time means the burning cost there. So none of them is able to completely get rid of the uh, burning uh, consideration here. The all right. So the natural question for us is that, can we hope to find the regret optimal algorithm uh, with, with no burning cost here? All right, okay, so this will be a uh, very imprecise, but a little technical slide here is that, Okay, so I'm going to briefly tell you what the algorithm is. It's going to be a very simple modification of the um, the UCB VI algorithm uh, with only almost only one modification there. It's the so-called doubling uh, update rules there. 
So very, very informally, this means that as every state action pair will only be updated when it has been visited either the first time, second time, fourth time, eighth time, or two to the power number of times there. I'm not going to update it every time it is visited. I'm only going to update it you know, in a much, much infrequent manner. So from this picture, so this is a not a precise picture, but it roughly tell you what's going on. So you have an UCBVI that's sort of like, every time I see a sample related to SAH, I'm going to make a, a update to my empirical model and then redo everything. Uh, I don't want to do it. I want to do things in a much less frequent way. So first time, uh, see, I updated. Uh, Sure. So I think I think I think I I should I, I, my plot is not quite correct. So it should be one, two, four, and eight there. But roughly, this is the idea: is that you don't want to do it every time. You want to have a spacing there, and then this spacing can increase your uh, uh, exponentially. All right. Okay. All right. So why do we do this? The reason is that uh, this allows you to make sure that you don't update the model too often. Uh, but if by doing so, this actually allows you to describe the dynamics with a much, much smaller complexity. When I talk about complexity, I mean, for those of you who are familiar with uh, high dimensional probability, this means some sort of covering number. So by doing so, I have a much, much less covering number in order to describe the change of the visitation counts there. All right. Oh, and, and that turns out to be the most important part for our analysis in order to um, uh, get rid of the, the burning cost there. So finally, this is a result. Uh, the algorithm, which is still a model-based algorithm, is able to achieve this thing. So this is a minimized optimal up to a logarithmic factor. So, so far, this remains the only algorithm uh, in the literature that is able to uh, achieve regret optimality. Um, without any burning cause in this case. And the, our main contribution technically is about how to design, how to modify the algorithm so as to allow us to carefully take care of the statistical dependency there. So in most, all, every problem, the hardest part in the sample limited regime is about how to take care of the statistical uh, correlations there. And so this is uh, our main contributions there. All right, okay, so I'm going to uh, conclude here. Uh, I have told you two stories, uh, and for both of the stories, model-based algorithms uh, are um, the optimal solutions, and it turns out that they remain the only solutions factory that can achieve optimal uh, sample complexity without any burning costs. Um, similar messages uh, uh, hold for other settings as well, uh, which I don't have time to explain, but I'm just going to quickly mention is that if you go into offline reinforcement learning, uh, a pessimistic version of a uh, model-based approach is optimal, full range optimal. If you want to learn the Nash equilibrium in uh, two player zero sum Markov games, this is also much, some ver much, much more carefully designed version of model-based algorithm. It's also the only approach there that can approach um, uh, full range sample optimality. All right, so uh, the conclusion is that uh, reinforcement learning actually offers a lot of opportunities uh, and it can be very well, under it can be understood better uh, if we can leverage our insights from a lot of different fields like high dimensional stats, large dimensional, uh, large scale optimization, game theory, online machine learning, adversarial machine learning, so on and so forth. Uh, the papers are here. All right. Okay. That's all. Thanks very much. So, yeah, very nice. So, Thanks. I have a question. So, like if you use a double trick in the online, in the model free online learning, uh, or if what's you use the double trick the online, in the model free online learning. Uh huh. Then, what's the then question we'll, about like, the model? What is the difficulties? What are the difficulties? You mean the difficulty, technical difficulty yeah, of analyzing yeah, it yeah, yeah. or the yeah. difficulty? I don't think it's optimal actually. So so it's optimal if the sample, so, okay. 
You said the model free one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So model free one. Let, let me start from the Q learning base thing. All right. So usually people, my colleague Shijin start this Q U C B thing by combining U C B with Q learning. Sure. Uh is I think it's off by an edge age factor, regardless of how large your sample size is. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's worse than it's sort of like provably worse than this by an age factor. All right. Okay. Now then people try to come actually it's still my my poster actually <laughs> the the same John here actually take, he came up with the variance reduction idea mm -hmm. uh, that allows you to you know like bring the sample complexity down to optimal if you have enough sample size. Right. But variance reduction is a very very expensive operation every iteration. So asymptotically it's fine, but running even one iteration takes already takes sufficient large number of uh, samples that already exceeds what you want in the in that case. So uh, so variance reduction has been exploited by uh, Zahan John, so my postdoc, and also in the simulated, simulated setting by uh, Martin Wainwright. Uh, and then he also realized there, like even one in one, in one iteration already exceeds the budget. So, so if you have many, many, you can run it for many, many, uh, very, very long, then that's fine. This uh, one-time cost sort of like amortize over everything, so it's no longer an issue. But if you have very limited samples, this is you can't you can we might not even be able to afford even one iteration. Yeah. Because variance reduction requires you to first have a good rough estimate about the thing and then use it to serve as a reference to correct bias or variability in the right. but but having that requires some sample. So so it's not just a technical difficulty. I think. So just curious, like, uh, have you done experiment to see like the doubling trick actually helps in? Uh, not yet, <laughs> not yet. So one thing that I'm not sure is that I don't know whether UCBVI is provably suboptimal or not. Mm -hmm. It's just that the the analysis is far from optimal, but it might be that the, it's the the issue of the analysis rather than the algorithm. Yeah, but I think using this doubling trick is helpful in practice compared to UCBVI as well because it allows you to have a much a lower switching cost. Mm -hmm. Usually, this is, some people actually care about this switching cost thing right. as well. So, there's a question. No. Oh. Yeah. Will adding an analytical model that's different from the simulator to guide exploration improve sample? Uh, what is an analytical? So can can I ask what is an analytical model here? Like maybe he can ask himself to ask. How who is this? It's an anonymous person. <laughs> 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 So I, I, I just, okay, let me just say once. He said if some of the model is known, like some of the transition probability actually are known. Transition is known rather yeah, than the transition. I, 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 think, I think it helps, I think it helps. So there's a lot of research recently about this hybrid RL thing. Uh, hybrid RL is like you combine online RL with another different kind of things, like either, simula either unbiased version of simulated environment, which you know could be something that you mean, and also like an offline IO is like still generated from the true environment, just from different, uh, but just taken by different, you know, like behavior policy or tip. Uh, combining them can probably help actually. You can go below this sample complexity limit, actually. You can you can prove you can prove that you can do that. And it can, if you design it carefully, it can improve, strictly improve the best of both of them. So it's not just like achieving the best of both of them. You can strict, get strict improvement compared to each of them. Um, okay. Higher the fidelity model. Yeah, yeah. So uh, for example, like if you have simulator, which is like absolutely unbiased, that I think is probably a high uh, fidelity model. Right. It's right. because they are sometimes people are considered this seem to real transfer where you know the simulated environment might be slightly different from the the real environment. So the samples you generated there might be uh, not that good. Uh, but when what I was talking about is that if your simulator is completely unbiased, it's really just generated from the true environment. 
that could be understood as a high fidelity model. And in that case, we can probably make it better. Okay, hopefully that this, does it answer your question? <laughs> Yeah, also, uh, I'm thinking like if you have uh, like very high fidelity model with a simulator, it's equivalent to having infinite amount of samples. Yeah, right? so you can have yeah. infinite, so low cost, infinite amount of samples. Yeah. Um, I have a question regarding the first trick that you have where like you have your model and then you have your reward. Yeah. And I'm trying to visualize it because it seems that the trick that you have is you portray your reward, then you have a special structure on your policies. And because now we have a unique policy that was the second important ingredient for your breadcrumb. Uh, just want to make sure which part of the it's the first, a, the first part. The first part, and where you perturb the rewards. So, can you say the question again? Yeah, I'm just trying to understand this because, like, if we can visualize that each reward it maps to a optimal policy, right? Yes. And you are basically saying that slightly perturbing your reward has a huge perturbation in your policy space. Uh, okay. So, uh, so can we do this without your policy is this? going to be changed? Okay. So first of all, yeah, you, if you perturb it, your policy could have could be very different from the original one, the optimal policy. But the so so there is no continuity in the mapping from the reward part to the po optimal policy. But there is continu con continuity when you map reward to the optimal value function. Okay. So the value is going to be close, even because you are re perturbing reward tiny a little bit, you can, your total reward, value function is a cum cumulative reward, it will not be changed too much. So there is continuity there. So even though the policies, optimal policy might change drastically, but the value is not going to change. And my goal is essentially just to find a policy that's achieve a value function that is good enough. I'm not necessarily constraining myself to, I only care about this type of optimal policy. So there might be multiple of them. I'm not constraining myself to, I only care about optimal policy one. So any of them should, should be fine. Does it make sense? Next issue.